Our text this morning comes from Mark's Gospel in chapter 14. We're going to be reading verses 22 through 25. And this is, again, the institution of the Lord's table uh, at the Passover meal, just before our Lord is uh, betrayed and uh, handed over to his enemies to be handed over to the Romans for crucifixion. Our Lord Jesus shares this last meal with his disciples, again reminding them of why it is he came into the world, and that was to lay down his life for them. Mark chapter 14, verses 22 through 25. While they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Well, as you know, we, uh, we were looking at the... Um, Passover meal. Last week we saw that it was here that Jesus um, announced that someone was going to betray him and that it would have been better for that one who was going to betray him if he had never been born. Again, the warning of damnation, the warning of the reality of, of hell. Now we come to the, the uh, really the end of the Passover meal, or we might say somewhere in, in the middle. We're not exactly sure, but we do know shortly after this. Uh, they conclude with a hymn, and they go out to the Mount of Olives for prayer. Now, I do believe at this point in the Passover meal, the one who was to betray him, the one who, for, you know, for whom it had been better if he had never been born, the one whom Jesus said was a devil from the beginning, I believe that Judas has exited the meal. Now, there's this debate, I think, going on in various circles of whether or not Judas was actually present when the Lord says, this is my body, which is for you. Well, I don't think he was, because that was not for Judas. Uh, Judas was, was a devil. If Judas was going to betray him, Christ's sacrifice was not for him. So Judas has gone, gone to betray him. The next time we see Judas, he actually comes out to the Mount of Olives with a group of soldiers ready to arrest Jesus Christ and comes up to him and kisses him and betrays him in that way, which means Judas was not with them at that point, but comes with the soldiers. So Jesus is now left with his own people, with those who are his own, his own sheep. And it's now that he reveals something regarding the Passover that the disciples may not have known, or perhaps they did know but didn't fully realize. And that is that the Passover itself was pointing to our Lord's sacrifice. Now, of course, Jesus knew this. I think year after year as he celebrated the Passover with his own family, remember he did so up until the age of 30 when he began his ministry, from the time when it dawned on him, uh, and again we need to realize that Jesus as a baby did not have infinite knowledge as a human being, you know, he, he, he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, which means he learned. Well, as Jesus continued to grow, of course, he learned what, who he was and, and why he was there. And he realized year after year as the Passover was being celebrated that it was pointing to why it is he came into the world. And certainly, as he was celebrating the Passover with his disciples during the three years of his ministry, he knew that was the reason he came into the world. He knew it was foreshadowing that one act the scripture points to by which he would forever cleanse his people of their sins and satisfy the Father's justice and allow them entrance into heaven. And that is his death on the cross. So Jesus, while they were eating, took some bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body. He also took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them. And they drank, and he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And then he said something that I don't think that we often think about, and maybe it's something we need to focus on more at the Lord's table, uh, because he says this in the context of the Lord's table. He says that he would never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when he drinks it new with them in the kingdom of God. 
Now, in light of what Jesus says at the table here, I want us to focus on three things. And I think it's the three ways that our Lord reveals his love to us as we come to the table. The first one is the most obvious, and that is in his laying his life down for us. The second one, I think, is one we also focus on at the table, which is uh, Jesus loves us in continually giving to us, through the table, spiritual food to refresh us and strengthen us. And then thirdly, the one thing we don't often think about, the table also declares to us the spiritual blessings which the Lord has prepared for us in his kingdom that we will get to enjoy forever. So first of all, as we prepare to come to the table, let's consider his love is displayed here in laying down his life for us. Remember, this is why Jesus Christ came into the world. This is why the Son of God became a man. It was that he might die for us. Jesus says in Matthew 20, verse 28, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is what the Passover was pointing to, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was the only sacrifice that could possibly remove our guilt, the only, satis or the only sacrifice that could possibly satisfy God's justice. Remember the Bible says the sins that you and I have committed against God are so great because of God's greatness, because he is infinitely holy, that no other sacrifice would do for us except one that has infinite value. And that's what Jesus Christ came to provide for us. That's what the Passover meal was pointing to. And that's why he laid down his life. But let's not forget why he did this. He did it for love. He did it out of love for his father. Jesus loved the father more than anyone else. And as you know in his ministry, desired more than anything that his father be glorified. And that's why he came into the world and why Jesus obeyed him perfectly with the kind of devotion that he showed. That's why our Lord Jesus Christ could say, really at any point in his ministry, to do the work that his father had sent him into the world to do was more important to him than his necessary bread. He loved his father. And so knowing full well that our sins had dishonored the father, and indebted us to the justice of God, he was willing to lay down his life so that his father might be fully satisfied and be able to show us mercy. You see, Jesus' love for the father and the father's desire to have us as his children, Jesus knew that, was aware of that, and was willing out of love for his father to make the payment that was necessary so that the father might be able to have us as his sons and daughters. Now, looking at the love of Jesus, we see that it's more than just a warm, fuzzy feeling that he had. Oh, I love my father, but I don't do anything for his honor and his glory. I just love him. No, it was a love that moved Jesus Christ to serve him and to glorify him with his whole life. By the way, I should mention that that is the example Jesus gives to us, and that is the standard to which our father actually calls us as well that we are to love him in the way Jesus loved him with our whole life, to give ourselves to him in a complete and, and full way, which is why, again, the greatest commandment in Scripture is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength, so much so that those we love and are most dear to us are a distant second. Jesus did what he did out of love for the Father, but let's not forget that the table reminds us of Jesus' love for you as well. It's not that he didn't love you, but because of the Father's sake, he was willing to do what he did. He also did this out of love for you. He was willing to lay down his life for you. When he spoke to his disciples on that night, he was also speaking to everyone who would trust in him and believe on him through their word. He was speaking also to you when he said, this is my body which is given for you. 
as we read in Luke's gospel. This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Remember that Jesus loved you as well when he gave his life on the cross. As God, Jesus actually loved you from all eternity. There was never a time when he didn't love you if you're trusting in him this morning. And it's interesting that as man, well, Jesus began to love you from the time that he understood it was the Father's plan to give him for you. From the time he understood that this, you would be his reward for the work that he would do. So Jesus didn't do this merely out of duty's sake, and I don't want to demean this, but not merely out of love for the Father, although primarily for that. He did it out of love for you. John writes in John 13, verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So the first thing that you are to remember as you come to the Lord's table is Jesus' love for you in giving himself for you that he might cleanse you of your sins and that you might be reconciled to the Father. Now secondly, he reveals his love by continuing to give you spiritual food from heaven. Now, every time you come to the Lord's table, and you receive the elements of the bread and wine by faith, looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus communicates to you, he gives to you spiritual bread from heaven. The Lord, as it were, communicates himself to you. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verses 32 through 35, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. At the Lord's table, there is the bread of life. Now, of course, you understand by now that Jesus does not mean that he is literal bread, even though the language that's used to describe him might lead you to the conclusion that Jesus somehow is giving us his flesh to eat and his blood to drink. We know that isn't the case. But he is spiritual bread. He is the bread of life. And the Lord tells us that if you come to the table and you look to him in faith, that he will feed you with the bread of life, the bread that actually gives eternal life. Now, just as you hoped in the Lord Jesus Christ at the very beginning of your Christian walk as your only hope of heaven, so when you come to the table and you trust in him, when you listen to his call to you to look to him again, to trust him again for this supply of spiritual food, he gives to you that food, that spiritual manna, which I believe ultimately is the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit is the one who imparts life. He is the one who breathes the life of our Lord Jesus Christ into your soul. He's the one who sustains that life and the one who is, is really going to be your life throughout all eternity. Jesus, as you know, did what was necessary in order that the Spirit of God might be given to you. Remember, your forefather, Adam, actually had the Spirit in the garden. That's the only way he could possibly walk with God and be pleasing to God. But when he sinned, the Spirit departed, which is when he sensed his nakedness, he lost that original righteousness. He lost that love for God. And all he had after that was a fear of God, a fear of retribution, and we would have to say also a hatred of God. But Jesus regains what Adam lost in the garden, and he is able to give us the spirit again. And that's why Jesus is called the bread of life, who gives life. Now again, the spirit is the life of God, and he is the one who places and sustains that life in your soul. So as we come to the table, remember 
that the Lord has provided you with spiritual bread to eat. And as you look to the Lord Jesus Christ, trust Him to give you this, this spiritual bread, this spiritual manna that comes down out of heaven to give you His Holy Spirit. And the Lord will, out of His love for you, feed you and nurture that spiritual life in you. Finally, the, the supper reminds you of his love in that he has prepared spiritual blessings for you in heaven. Now, I hope you can see what's going on here. The table actually reminds you of the Lord's love in the past when he laid down his life for you. It reminds you of the Lord's love for you in the present as he continually feeds your soul with spiritual food. But it also reminds you or makes you, I suppose, look to a future aspect of this love, and that is to the eternal blessings that the Lord has prepared for you. Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, what was Jesus' reason for telling the disciples this? Well, he just told them he was gonna die. I mean, he had been telling them throughout his ministry and of course, they were beginning to catch on that um, he, he had to die and three days later he would rise again. And now at the Passover meal, he's telling them that, that this, this bread and this cup represents his body which is going to be broken, his blood which is going to be shed. It's dawning on them that Jesus is going to die. But Jesus reminds them that he's not going to stay dead. Now he tells them in order to comfort them that there is something that is yet in the future that they were going to share together. When he, along with them, would sit down and enjoy the blessings of eating and drinking together in the kingdom of God. Now, what is he talking about here? You know, when is this going to take place? Well, let's read a couple of passages that give us a little, a little bit of a clue as to uh, when that's going to be. First of all, in Luke 22, verses 28 through 30, Jesus says, You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, in Matthew's Gospel, we read this in Matthew 19, verses 27 and 28. Then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. By the way, we have devoted ourselves to you in the way that you have devoted yourself to my Father. We've left everything and we followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now again, what is he talking about here? When is this going to happen? What is the regeneration that Jesus is referring to here? Now the regeneration, as you know, means rebirth. Is Jesus here talking about the time when the world will be reborn? Is he talking about the new heavens and the new earth? Is he talking about a millennium that's going to follow his second coming when there's a thousand years of peace and prosperity on the earth as dispensationalists believe, many evangelicals believe? Well, I don't think so. Because this is the time of Christ's reign. And we know that that time is now. Jesus said that it was in the regeneration that he would sit on his glorious throne and basically rule over the world. Well, when did Jesus sit on the throne? Well, that happened immediately following his resurrection and his ascension. The author to the Hebrews tells us quite plainly that after he had made one sacrifice for all time, he sat down at the right hand of the Father waiting from that time until all his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. Even though Christ's enemies, as we see in Psalm 2, were coming against him, we're not going to have this man to rule over us. And they tried to break the chains and the fetters, as it were, that, that the, uh, the king had on them. Uh, the Lord laughed at them. He says, as for me, I have installed my king upon Mount Zion, and he calls upon the world 
to worship him and to kiss the son. The regeneration that Jesus is referring to when the disciples sit down and eat and drink with him in his kingdom is not future, but something that must be going on now. It's something that follows the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose work in principle has made all things new. And of course, in the future, we know is actually going to work itself out in such a way that it does bring the new heavens and the new earth. This perhaps makes greater sense out of what, um, the way that uh, Paul applies the, um, the second psalm uh, to Jesus' resurrection. You are my son, today I have begotten you. I mean, usually when we read that, we think about the fact that Jesus is the only begotten son of God, begotten of the virgin and so forth, and he is the only begotten son of God, and we know that's true. But yet, it's, re it's applied to the resurrection. Why is it applied to the resurrection? Well, it's because at the resurrection, Jesus, as it were, was renewed. He was born again. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And in this, as it were, rebirth from the dead, not only is Jesus reborn, but the entire creation with him takes place at that time. So we might say when Jesus was raised again from the dead, that was the beginning of the regeneration. Now that means that the disciples right now are ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes sense out of the fact that they'd be ruling and reigning over the 12 tribes of Israel and so forth. It also makes sense out of what John tells us is the case in the book of Revelation. For every one of his people that would make it through the great tribulation, which I hope you know by now, at least that I believe, took place in 70 AD. We read in Revelation 20 something very similar to what we see going on here. John writes, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. Sounds very similar to what Jesus just promised his disciples. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Well, who are these people that did these things and who were faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ through all these trials and temptations that came upon the earth except his disciples, the ones whom he was promising would eat and drink with him at his table in his kingdom, taking up rule with him and actually judging the nations with him. Jesus was talking about something that was future for them, but something which is taking place right now. Now, the point is that Jesus is talking about what's going to take place after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, after this begetting, as it were, again, and his ascension. That they would sit down with him at his table in his kingdom and would enjoy the spiritual blessings of heaven. Now, whether those be literal blessings of eating and drinking bread and wine, as it were, or whether it's just referring to spiritual blessings, we know it's something good. And we also need to realize that this is something he not only gave to them, but something he gives to all who are faithful to him. Something the Lord is going to give to you out of his love if you trust him and persevere in overcoming all those trials and difficulties that you have to face in this life by His grace. By the way, the Lord promises many things to those who will overcome. They all amount, I think, to spiritual blessings, although some of them may refer to some physical blessings. But if we look at the blessings that the Lord promises, even the churches of Revelation, if they will just persevere and overcome, we basically see what it is that Jesus is, is talking about when he says to his disciples that you and I are going to sit down together in the kingdom of heaven and we're going to eat and drink together. This is what he says. Revelation 2.7, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. That's referring to heaven. Verse 11, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. No, of course not, because they're a part of the second death. Uh, birth, as it were. They've been born again, and um, they know the Lord, and He has secured them. Verse 17, to him who overcomes, to him 
I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. In verses 26 and 27, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. Those who overcome will rule with the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, verse 5. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. And then listen to this, verse 21. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, I believe that this whole catalog of blessings are those that Jesus holds out to his church then, to those who are actually entering into that tribulation and who would actually endure through it and make it to the end. This is what God or what the Lord Jesus promises, these blessings in heaven. You will sit down with me and eat at my table, and you will sit down with me on my throne, and you will rule with me over the nations. Uh, again, Revelation chapter 20 reminds us, I saw the souls of those who had beheaded. They came to life and they ruled with Christ for a thousand years. That thousand years is the time frame in which we are living. Everyone who overcomes gets to go to heaven, sit at the table of the Lord, and enjoy not only that fellowship with the Lord and those blessings of heaven, but also this position of ruling by the way, don't, don't be too concerned about the fact that you don't know how to rule. I'm sure that the Lord will give you that ability when you get there. But the big question, again, is this. How can you overcome so that you can make it to the end and enter into those blessings which the Lord has prepared? Well, again, the same author of the book of Revelation writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 5. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you trust him alone to save you and turn from your sins and submit to him as your Lord, you will overcome because God's grace will make sure that you do. You will inherit these promises because of his love. Again, the table of the Lord reminds us that the love of God is here to give you the grace to persevere and to enter into those blessings at last. So at the table, there is not only the promise of past love, what the Lord Jesus was willing to do to lay down his life in order to have you. And there is not only the promise of present love that the Lord is granting to you continual supply of spiritual bread from heaven to sustain your soul, and to sustain that life and love in you while you go through this world. But there is also the promise of the blessings of heaven for those who will overcome by his grace forever in the kingdom of your Lord. And so as you prepare to come to the table, uh, remember these things. Look back to his love on the cross. He was crucified for you. Look to him now for spiritual manner from heaven. He has promised and pledged himself to feed your souls all the way through this life and actually forever. And look forward to what the Lord has actually promised you in heaven, that if you overcome, you will sit down at his table and enjoy that fruit of the vine, that spiritual food forever, as well as ruling with him during the present time. Let's remember these things that the Lord has provided for us in love, and let's let these things motivate us to give ourselves even more fully to him. Now, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and as we do, let's do what we would normally do as we're preparing to come to the table, because I've already instituted the table, okay? 
So right now, let's search our hearts and let's take what we've just heard and let's ask that the Lord would apply this to us so that we will be ready to come to the table. Spend a few moments in prayer.